Chapter Four of Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Short Stories by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Chapter Four. An Unpleasant Predicament, Part Two. His star carried him away. He walked confidently in at the open gate and contemptuously thrust aside with his foot the shaggy, husky little sheep-dog who flew at his legs with a hoarse bark, more as a matter of form than with any real intention. Along a wooden plank he went to the covered porch which led like a sentry-box to the yard, and by three decaying wooden steps he went up to the tiny entry. Here, though a tallow candle or something in the way of a night-light was burning somewhere in a corner, it did not prevent Ivan Ilyitch from putting his left foot, just as it was, in its galosh, into a galantine, which had been stood out there to cool. Ivan Ilyitch bent down, and, looking with curiosity, he saw that there were two other dishes of some sort of jelly, and also two shapes apparently of blancmange. The squashed galantine embarrassed him, and for one brief instant the thought flashed through his mind whether he should not slink away at once. But he considered this too low, reflecting that no one would have seen him and that they would never think he had done it. He hurriedly wiped his galosh to conceal all traces, fumbled for the felt-covered door, opened it, and found himself in a very little ante-room. Half of it was literally piled up with great coats, wadded jackets, cloaks, capes, scarves, and galoshes. In the other half the musicians had been installed, two violins, a flute, and a double bass, a band of four, picked up, of course, in the street. They were sitting at an unpainted wooden table, lighted by a single tallow candle, and with the utmost vigor were sawing out the last figure of the quadrille. From the open door into the drawing-room one could see the dancers in the midst of dust, tobacco, smoke, and fumes. There was a frenzy of gaiety. There were sounds of laughter, shouts and shrieks from the ladies. The gentlemen stamped like a squadron of horses. Above all the bedlam there rang out words of command from the leader of the dance, probably an extremely free and easy and even unbuttoned gentleman. Gentlemen advance, ladies chain, set to partners, and so on and so on. Ivan Ilyitch, in some excitement, cast off his coat and galoshes, and with his cap in his hand went into the room. He was no longer reflecting, however. For the first minute nobody noticed him. All were absorbed in dancing the quadrille to the end. Ivan Ilyitch stood as though entranced and could make out nothing definite in the chaos. He caught glimpses of ladies' dresses, of gentlemen with cigarettes between their teeth. He caught a glimpse of a lady's pale blue scarf which flicked him on the nose. After the wearer, a medical student with his hair blown in all directions on his head pranced by in wild delight and jostled violently against him on the way. He caught a glimpse, too, of an officer of some description, who looked half a mile high. Someone in an unnaturally shrill voice shouted, Oh, Seldonimov, as the speaker flew by, stamping. It was sticky under Ivan Ilyitch's feet. Evidently the floor had been waxed. In the room, which was a very small one, there were about thirty people. But a minute later the quadrille was over, and almost at once the very thing Ivan Ilyitch had pictured when he was dreaming on the pavement took place. A stifled murmur, a strange whisper passed over the whole company, including the dancers, who had not yet had time to take breath and wipe their perspiring faces. All eyes, all faces, began quickly turning towards the newly arrived guest. Then they all seemed to draw back a little and beat a retreat. Those who had not noticed him were pulled by their coats or dresses and informed. They looked round and at once beat a retreat with the others. Ivan Ilyitch was still standing at the door without moving a step forward, and between him and the company there stretched an ever-widening empty space of floor, 
strewn with countless sweetmeat wrappings, bits of paper, and cigarette ends. All at once a young man in a uniform, with a shock of flaxen hair and a hooked nose, stepped timidly out into that empty space. He moved forward, hunched up, and looked at the unexpected visitor exactly with the expression with which a dog looks at its master when the latter has called him up and is going to kick him. "'Good evening, Seldonimov. Do you know me?' said Ivan Ilyitch, and felt at the same minute that he had said this very awkwardly. He felt, too, that he was perhaps doing something horribly stupid at that moment. "'Your Excellency,' muttered Seldonimov. "'To be sure, I have called in to see you quite by chance, my friend, as you can probably imagine.' But evidently Seldonimov could imagine nothing. He stood with staring eyes in the utmost perplexity. "'You won't turn me out, I suppose. Pleased or not, you must make a visitor welcome,' Ivan Ilyitch went on, feeling that he was confused to a point of unseemly feebleness, that he was trying to smile and was utterly unable, that the humorous reference to Stepan Nikiforovitch and Trifon was becoming more and more impossible. But, as ill-luck would have it, Seldonimov did not recover from his stupefaction, and still gazed at him with a perfectly idiotic air. Ivan Ilyitch winced. He felt that in another minute something incredibly foolish would happen. "'I am not in the way, am I? I'll go away,' he faintly articulated, and there was a tremor at the right corner of his mouth. But Seldonimov had recovered himself. "'Good heavens, Your Excellency, the honor he muttered, bowing hurriedly. Graciously, sit down, Your Excellency. And recovering himself still further, he motioned him with both hands to a sofa before which a table had been moved away to make room for the dancing. Ivan Ilyitch felt relieved and sank on the sofa. At once someone flew to move the table up to him. He took a cursory look round and saw that he was the only person sitting down. All the others were standing, even the ladies. A bad sign. But it was not yet time to reassure and encourage them. The company still held back, while before him, bending double, stood Seldonimov, utterly alone, still completely at a loss and very far from smiling. It was horrid. In short, our hero endured such misery at that moment that his Harun al-Rashid-like descent upon his subordinates for the sake of principle might well have been reckoned an heroic action. But suddenly a little figure made its appearance beside Seldonimov and began bowing. To his inexpressible pleasure and even happiness, Ivan Ilyitch at once recognized him as the head clerk of his office, Akim Petrovitch Zubikov, and though, of course, he was not acquainted with him, he knew him to be a business-like and exemplary clerk. He got up at once and held out his hand to Akim Petrovitch, his whole hand, not two fingers. The latter took it in both of his with the deepest respect. The general was triumphant. The situation was saved. And now, indeed, Seldonimov was no longer, so to say, the second person, but the third. It was possible to address his remarks to the head clerk in his necessity, taking him for an acquaintance and even an intimate one, and Seldonimov, meanwhile, could only be silent and be in a tremor of reverence, so that the proprieties were observed. And some explanation was essential, Ivan Ilyitch felt that. He saw that all the guests were expecting something, that the whole household was gathered together in the doorway, almost creeping, climbing over one another in their anxiety to see and hear him. What was horrid was that the head clerk, in his foolishness, remained standing. "'Why are you standing?' said Ivan Ilyitch, awkwardly motioning him to a seat on the sofa beside him. "'Oh, don't trouble, I'll sit here.' and Akim Petrovitch hurriedly sat down on a chair, almost as it was being put for him by Seldonimov, who remained obstinately standing. "'Can you imagine what happened?' addressing himself exclusively to Akim Petrovitch, in a rather quavering, though free and easy voice. 
he even drawled out his words with special emphasis on some syllables pronounced the vowel ah like eh in short felt and was conscious that he was being affected but could not control himself some external force was at work he was painfully conscious of many things at that moment can you imagine i have only just come from stepan nikiforovitch nikiforov's you have heard of him perhaps the privy councillor you know on that special committee akim petrovitch bent his whole person forward respectfully as much as to say of course we have heard of him he is your neighbour now ivan ilyitch went on for one instant for the sake of ease and good manners addressing seldonimov but he quickly turned away again on seeing from the latter's eyes that it made absolutely no difference to him the old fellow as you know has been dreaming all his life of buying himself a house well and he has bought it and a very pretty house too yes and to-day was his birthday and he had never celebrated it before he used even to keep it secret from us he was too stingy to keep it <laughs> but now he is so delighted over his new house that he invited semyon ivanovitch shipolenko and me you know akim petrovitch bent forward again he bent forward zealously ivan ilyitch felt somewhat comforted it had struck him indeed that the head clerk possibly was guessing that he was an indispensable point d'appui for his excellency at that moment that would have been more horrid than anything so we sat together the three of us he gave us champagne we talked about problems even disputed <laughs> akim petrovitch raised his eyebrows respectfully only that is not the point when i take leave of him at last he is a punctual old fellow goes to bed early you know in his old age i go out my trifon is nowhere to be seen i am anxious i make inquiries what has trifon done with the carriage it comes out that hoping i should stay on he had gone off to the wedding of some friend of his or sister maybe goodness only knows somewhere here on the petersburg side and took the carriage with him while he was about it again for the sake of good manners the general glanced in the direction of seldonimov the latter promptly gave a wriggle but not at all the sort of wriggle the general would have liked he has no sympathy no heart flashed through his brain you don't say so said akim petrovitch greatly impressed a faint murmur of surprise ran through all the crowd can you fancy my position ivan ilyitch glanced at them all there was nothing for it i set off on foot i thought i would trudge to the great prospect and there find some cabby <laughs> <laughs> akim petrovitch echoed again a murmur but this time on a more cheerful note passed through the crowd at that moment the chimney of a lamp on the wall broke with a crash some one rushed zealously to see to it seldonimov started and looked sternly at the lamp but the general took no notice of it and all was serene again i walked and the night was so lovely so still all at once i heard a band stamping dancing i inquired of a policeman it is seldonimov's wedding why you are giving a ball to all petersburg side my friend <laughs> he turned to seldonimov again <laughs> to be sure akim petrovitch responded there was a stir among the guests again but what was most foolish was that seldonimov though he bowed did not even now smile but seemed as though he were made of wood is he a fool or what thought ivan ilyitch he ought to have smiled at that point the ass and everything would have run easily there was a fury of impatience in his heart i thought i would go in to see my clerk he won't turn me out i expect pleased or not one must welcome a guest you must please excuse me my dear fellow if i am in the way i will go i only came in to have a look but little by little a general stir was beginning akim petrovitch looked at him with a mawkishly sweet expression as though to say how could your excellency be in the way 
all the guests stirred and began to display the first symptoms of being at their ease almost all the ladies sat down a good sign and a reassuring one the boldest spirits among them fanned themselves with their handkerchiefs one of them in a shabby velvet dress said something with intentional loudness the officer addressed by her would have liked to answer her as loudly but seeing that they were the only ones speaking aloud he subsided the men for the most part government clerks with two or three students among them looked at one another as though egging each other on to unbend cleared their throats and began to move a few steps in different directions no one however was particularly timid but they were all restive and almost all of them looked with a hostile expression at the personage who had burst in upon them to destroy their gaiety the officer ashamed of his cowardice began to edge up to the table but i say my friend allow me to ask you your name ivan ilyitch asked seldonimov porfiry petrovitch your excellency answered the latter with staring eyes as though on parade introduce me porfiry petrovitch to your bride take me to her i and he showed signs of a desire to get up but seldonimov ran full speed to the drawing-room the bride however was standing close by at the door but as soon as she heard herself mentioned she hid a minute later seldonimov led her up by the hand the guests all moved aside to make way for them ivan ilyitch got up solemnly and addressed himself to her with a most affable smile very very much pleased to make your acquaintance he pronounced with a most aristocratic half-bow especially on such a day he gave a meaning smile there was an agreeable flutter among the ladies charme the lady in the velvet dress pronounced almost aloud the bride was a match for seldonimov she was a thin little lady not more than seventeen pale with a very small face and a sharp little nose her quick active little eyes were not at all embarrassed on the contrary they looked at him steadily and even with a shade of resentment evidently seldonimov was marrying her for her beauty she was dressed in a white muslin dress over a pink slip her neck was thin but she had a figure like a chicken's with the bones all sticking out she was not equal to making any response to the general's affability but she is very pretty he went on in an undertone as though addressing seldonimov only though intentionally speaking so that the bride could hear but on this occasion too seldonimov again answered absolutely nothing and did not even wriggle ivan ilyitch fancied that there was something cold suppressed in his eyes as though he had something peculiarly malignant in his mind and yet he had at all costs to wring some sensibility out of him why that was the object of his coming they are a couple though he thought and he turned again to the bride who had seated herself beside him on the sofa but in answer to his two or three questions he got nothing but yes or no and hardly that if only she had been overcome with confusion he thought to himself then i should have begun to banter her but as it is my position is impossible and as ill luck would have it akim petrovitch too was mute though this was only due to his foolishness it was still unpardonable my friends haven't i perhaps interfered with your enjoyment he said addressing the whole company he felt that the very palms of his hands were perspiring no don't trouble your excellency we are beginning directly but now we are getting cool answered the officer the bride looked at him with pleasure the officer was not old and wore the uniform of some branch of the service seldonimov was still standing in the same place bending forward and it seemed as though his hooked nose stood out further than ever 
he looked and listened like a footman standing with the greatcoat on his arm waiting for the end of his master's farewell conversation ivan ilyitch made this comparison himself he was losing his head he felt that he was in an awkward position that the ground was giving way under his feet that he had got in somewhere and could not find his way out as though he were in the dark suddenly the guests all moved aside and a short thick-set middle-aged woman made her appearance dressed plainly though she was in her best with a big shawl on her shoulders pinned at her throat and on her head a cap to which she was evidently unaccustomed in her hands she carried a small round tray on which stood a full but uncorked bottle of champagne and two glasses neither more nor less evidently the bottle was intended for only two guests the middle-aged lady approached the general don't look down on us your excellency she said bowing since you have deigned to do my son the honor of coming to his wedding we beg you graciously to drink to the health of the young people do not disdain us do us the honor ivan ilyitch clutched at her as though she were his salvation she was by no means an old woman forty-five or forty-six not more but she had such a good-natured rosy-cheeked such a round and candid russian face she smiled so good-humouredly bowed so simply that ivan ilyitch was almost comforted and began to hope again so you are the mother of your son he said getting up from the sofa yes my mother your excellency mumbled seldonimov craning his long neck and thrusting forward his long nose again ah i am delighted delighted to make your acquaintance do not refuse us your excellency with the greatest pleasure the tray was put down seldonimov dashed forward to pour out the wine ivan ilyitch still standing took the glass i am particularly particularly glad on this occasion that i can he began that i can testify before all of you in short as your chief i wish you madam he turned to the bride and you friend porfiry i wish you the fullest completest happiness for many long years and he positively drained the glass with feeling the seventh he had drunk that evening seldonimov looked at him gravely and even sullenly the general was beginning to feel an agonizing hatred of him and that scarecrow he looked at the officer keeps obtruding himself he might at least have shouted hurrah and it would have gone off it would have gone off and you too akim petrovitch drink a glass to their health added the mother addressing the head clerk you are his superior he is under you look after my boy i beg you as a mother and don't forget us in the future our good kind friend akim petrovitch how nice these old russian women are thought ivan ilyitch she has livened us all up i have always loved the democracy at that moment another tray was brought to the table it was brought in by a maid wearing a crackling cotton dress that had never been washed and a crinoline she could hardly grasp the tray in both hands it was so big on it there were numbers of plates of apples sweets fruit meringues and fruit cheeses walnuts and so on and so on the tray had been till then in the drawing-room for the delectation of all the guests and especially the ladies but now it was brought to the general alone do not disdain our humble fare your excellency what we have we are pleased to offer the old lady repeated bowing delighted said ivan ilyitch and with real pleasure took a walnut and cracked it between his fingers he had made up his mind to win popularity at all costs meantime the bride suddenly giggled what is it asked ivan ilyitch with a smile encouraged by this sign of life ivan kostenkinitch here makes me laugh she answered looking down 
the general distinguished indeed a flaxen-headed young man exceedingly good-looking who was sitting on a chair at the other end of the sofa whispering something to madame seldonimov the young man stood up he was apparently very young and very shy i was telling the lady about a dream-book your excellency he muttered as though apologizing about what sort of dream-book asked ivan ilyitch condescendingly there is a new dream-book a literary one i was telling the lady that to dream of mr panayev means spilling coffee on one's shirt-front what innocence thought ivan ilyitch with positive annoyance though the young man flushed very red as he said it he was incredibly delighted that he had said this about mr panayev to be sure i have heard of it responded his excellency no there is something better than that said a voice quite close to ivan ilyitch there is a new encyclopedia being published and they say mr kreevsky will write articles and satirical literature this was said by a young man who was by no means embarrassed but rather free and easy he was wearing gloves and a white waistcoat and carried a hat in his hand he did not dance and looked condescending for he was on the staff of a satirical paper called the firebrand and gave himself airs accordingly he had come casually to the wedding invited as an honoured guest of the seldonimovs with whom he was on intimate terms and with whom only a year before he had lived in very poor lodgings kept by a german woman he drank vodka however and for that purpose had more than once withdrawn to a snug little back room to which all the guests knew their way the general disliked him extremely and the reason that's funny broke in joyfully the flaxen-headed young man who had talked of the shirt-front and at whom the young man on the comic paper looked with hatred in consequence it's funny your excellency because it is supposed by the writer that mr kreevsky does not know how to spell and thinks that satirical ought to be written with a y instead of an i but the poor young man scarcely finished his sentence he could see from his eyes that the general knew all this long ago for the general himself looked embarrassed and evidently because he knew it the young man seemed inconceivably ashamed he succeeded in effacing himself completely and remained very melancholy all the rest of the evening but to make up for that the young man on the staff of the firebrand came up nearer and seemed to be intending to sit down somewhere close by such free and easy manners struck ivan ilyitch as rather shocking tell me please porfiry he began in order to say something why i have always wanted to ask you about it in person why you are called seldonimov instead of pseudonimov your name surely must be pseudonimov i cannot inform you exactly your excellency said seldonimov it must have been that when his father went into the service they made a mistake in his papers so that he has remained now seldonimov put in akim petrovitch that does happen undoubtedly the general said with warmth undoubtedly for only think pseudonimov comes from the literary word pseudonym while seldonimov means nothing due to foolishness added akim petrovitch you mean what is due to foolishness the russian common people in their foolishness often alter letters and sometimes pronounce them in their own way for instance they say nevalid instead of invalid oh yes nevalid <laughs> mumber too they say your excellency boomed out the tall officer who had long been itching to distinguish himself in some way what do you mean by mumber mumber instead of number your excellency oh yes mumber instead of number to be sure to be sure <laughs> ivan ilyitch had to do a chuckle for the benefit of the officer too the officer straightened his tie another thing they say is nigh by the young man on the comic paper put in but his excellency tried not to hear this his chuckles were not at everybody's disposal nigh by instead of near the young man on the comic paper persisted in evident irritation ivan ilyitch looked at him sternly 
come why persist seldonimov whispered to him why i was talking mayn't one speak the latter protested in a whisper but he said no more and with secret fury walked out of the room he made his way straight to the attractive little back room where for the benefit of the dancing gentlemen vodka of two sorts salt fish caviar into slices and a bottle of very strong sherry of russian make had been set early in the evening on a little table covered with a yaroslav cloth with anger in his heart he was pouring himself out a glass of vodka when suddenly the medical student with the dishevelled locks the foremost dancer and cutter of capers at seldonimov's ball rushed in he fell on the decanter with greedy haste they are just going to begin he said rapidly helping himself come and look i am going to dance a solo on my head after supper i shall risk the fish dance it is just the thing for the wedding so to speak a friendly hint to seldonimov she's a jolly creature that cleopatra semyonovna you can venture on anything you like with her he's a reactionary said the young man on the comic paper gloomily as he tossed off his vodka who is a reactionary why the personage before whom they set those sweetmeats he's a reactionary i tell you what nonsense muttered the student and he rushed out of the room hearing the opening bars of the quadrille left alone the young man on the comic paper poured himself out another glass to give himself more assurance and independence he drank and ate a snack of something and never had the actual civil councillor ivan ilyitch made for himself a bitterer foe more implacably bent on revenge than was the young man on the staff of the firebrand whom he had so slighted especially after the latter had drunk two glasses of vodka alas ivan ilyitch suspected nothing of the sort he did not suspect another circumstance of prime importance either which had an influence on the mutual relations of the guests and his excellency the fact was that though he had given a proper and even detailed explanation of his presence at his clerk's wedding this explanation did not really satisfy any one and the visitors were still embarrassed but suddenly everything was transformed as though by magic all were reassured and ready to enjoy themselves to laugh to shriek to dance exactly as though the unexpected visitor were not in the room the cause of it was a rumor a whisper a report which spread in some unknown way that the visitor was not quite it seemed was in fact a little top-heavy and though this seemed at first a horrible calumny it began by degrees to appear to be justified suddenly everything became clear what was more they felt all at once extraordinarily free and it was just at this moment that the quadrille for which the medical student was in such haste the last before supper began and just as ivan ilyitch meant to address the bride again intending to provoke her with some innuendo the tall officer suddenly dashed up to her and with a flourish dropped on one knee before her she immediately jumped up from the sofa and whisked off with him to take her place in the quadrille the officer did not even apologize and she did not even glance at the general as she went away she seemed in fact relieved to escape after all she has a right to be thought ivan ilyitch and of course they don't know how to behave hm don't you stand on ceremony friend porfiry he said addressing seldonimov perhaps you have arrangements to make or something please don't put yourself out why does he keep guard over me he thought to himself seldonimov with his long neck and his eyes fixed intently upon him began to be insufferable in fact all this was not the thing not the thing at all but ivan ilyitch was still far from admitting this End of chapter four